I am about to head off for a trip for a few days, but I thought I had to share this with you before I leave. When I started this series, as you'll recall, I said I wanted to reach out to the other side. So from the other side. And my guest today is someone from across the chasm, Kevin Logan. His channel is largely devoted to attacking anti-SJWs. Now, I did not invite Kevin on to give him a hard time. I think it's important to let people's ideas speak for themselves and then to assess them on their own merits, which I encourage you to do in the comments. After all, isn't this the very reason that we're against no platforming? <laughs> What do you think constitutes the greatest threat to Western civilization, and why? Um, fascism is the short answer. Um, the slightly longer answer would be um, the various different types of fascism, be, whether it's the more traditional sort of neo-Nazi um, fascism we're more aware of, or the kind of um, religious extremism. Uh, either uh, Islamic would be the sort of most prominent one at the moment, but the, the Christian version of, it, of that in America is. Um, potentially possibly more dangerous in terms of um, trying to destroy the separation of church and state. And ultimately that's the point, is it? it's the the liberal reforms of uh, the, the post-Enlightenment period are under threat constantly by these people. And that's essentially why they're a threat to Western civilization, or at least the bits of Western civilization that are worth protecting. Oh, okay, well, I, I actually have two uh, questions on that. Uh, first of all, how far away? I mean, you, you mentioned um, certain people in America. How far away do you think uh, those things are from happening, uh, either in Europe or in America? Um, they're never that far away in terms of the potential. There's always the possibility that they, they could make relatively swift rises to power. And I think history shows us that. As it currently stands, um, I don't think Europe's that close to, I think, the, the defeats of the likes of um, uh, Le Pen and Wilders um, have shown that the people of Europe aren't quite up for that kind of shite at the moment. But unfortunately, I think there's been, with the rise of um, kind of uh, far-right extremism in America, I, I would suggest that that's much closer, certainly much closer than I would ever be comfortable with. But in terms of how, in terms of whether it's imminent or not, I don't think it's quite that drastic yet. But it's something certainly to watch. So, so I mean, where do you? Because I've seen a lot of talk about fascism and Trump and his support. You've obviously been online, you know, a good while now. You were you were on it during uh, during the whole election. You saw it play out. Yeah. Um, I've often wondered how much. Um, how can I put this? How much is the kind of the authoritarian tendencies of Trump exaggerated in your view versus the reality on the ground? Like, like is somebody like a Steve Bannon or a, or or even a Milo, a Milo, uh, you know, in our space, Milo, is he really a, a fa are these people really f fascist in that way, or are they somewhere on a spectrum? I do. I don't. I actually don't think Trump is a fascist. I think Trump's just Machiavellian. I think he's prepared to play any card he needs to. In the same way that when he was in New York, he'd play. He was a Democrat, and then um, uh, knowing he would never get the the ticket on the Democratic side, um, moved over and, and is now pretends to be some sort of ultra religious conservative type. And he isn't. I don't think he's either of those things because I don't think he has a philosophy. So I don't think he's a fascist. But he's more than prepared to use. Uh, people who are as useful idiots, and I think Bannon um, Bannon is much more of a fascist. But again, I think he's more Mach Machiavellian in the sense that he's prepared to use those useful idiots. But unfortunately, those useful idiots are a swamp that does need to be drained. Right. Okay. Um, and the the other thing, I mean, I have to ask you this question. You know, many of the people I've had on this show uh, would say that, that the biggest threat to the freedom of speech, to our liberal values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, doesn't actually come from the right or the far right, but is actually coming from the left or the far left. Uh, you know, groups like Antifa or the shutting down of free speech on campuses, and that they have actually argued that this in itself is a form of fascism, or if you want to put it another way, a return to kind of Stalinist authoritarianism. What do you say to people who see the threat coming from that direction? 
Um, I I disagree fundamentally with the concept that any shutting down of um, anyone is automatically either fascist or, or necessarily against free speech because the concept of free speech absolutism is childish to the point of fucking being embarrassing. I think that's a really stupid thing to, to argue. I mean, the, the obvious example would be something like libel laws. Everyone supports the idea that you can't just go around fucking lying about people and ruining their reputation. So the concept of having absolute free speech is nonsense. And so you have to set reasonable boundaries. One of those reasonable boundaries I would... Ex- <clears throat> suggest is embodied and i don't support antifa 100 percent in everything they do but i think what antifa do is set a very very important boundary at their own expense as well because of course it's uh, nazis fight back and of course the state can imprison you for the use of uh, violence but what they do is that they use physical resistance against people who would shut down the free speech of everyone and in the past we've seen it these people uh, have slaughtered pe- pe- people by the millions. They've been the most destructive force that humanity has ever seen. So, and I think Antifa are a bulwark against that, regardless of whether you like their politics or not particularly. I think they're an important um, stabilizing force in Europe, especially, but in America more so in recent times. Is, I mean, is there not. Um, how can I put this? Have you heard of this con- um, word concept creep, where. You know, you, you set a boundary there. Okay, so let, let's just say you're right that it's, it's correct to fight, uh, you know, fascists, uh, actual fascists in America and in Europe. But can you see how there's a slippery slope between that and, for example, somebody saying, well, hold on, uh, some of the methods that Black Lives Matter are using aren't really okay, or the thing that they're arguing for in itself seems discriminatory or I don't know, let, let's say, let's say me, for example, I am opposed to a, affirmative action because it has a terrible track record. The empirical evidence says that wherever it has been tried, it, it has not been a success. It creates resentment. It's a bad policy. And I, you know, I just think it's fundamentally wrongheaded to think that because, I don't know, say, let's say 10% of the population are black, therefore 10% of a workforce has to be black. I just think that that's, uh, you know, that's just playing uh, kind of games with the economy that nobody, know, nobody knows what the consequences will be. Can you, can, you see the, can you see that when you start giving a group like Antifa uh, kind of power in that way, that all of a sudden you could get to a position where somebody's saying that, well, basically... I'm a racist for my, just because I oppose these policies, and therefore it's okay to shut somebody like me down. Do did, did you, did you see how that's a slope? Yeah, absolutely. I, first, I, I contest your point about um, affirmative action in the sense that uh, just because we don't know the, the outcome of it necessarily means we shouldn't do something about the, in the, within the economy, because the economy is not divorced from societal factors. So the idea that if the, I mean, again, I think there is. If there is institutional racism in the world, we should do something to try and stop that within the economic sphere. The idea that it, the economy should be just essentially left because that's the way it is, is, I think, rather absurd. But that's by the by. Um, in terms of the slippery slope aspect, yes, I think there is um, there is a danger of that, of course. And there's a danger within anything where you take direct action um, uh, of, of essentially allowing people who aren't necessarily um, controlled or governed in any way to have that kind of um, uh, say as to who is a fair target and who isn't. Of course, there's always that danger. And I wouldn't support people um, attacking you for holding what, you know, a relatively mild views, even though I disagree with them. But the thing is, it's you used an in- interesting um, way of wording it, that they, if you give them power, Antifa having been given power, that that power has been ceded by a society and by... Uh, governments, governmental institutions that have refused to take this threat seriously, and people have stepped up into this into that um, vacuum. It's not people haven't given them that. Uh, Antifa have taken it because someone had to. But okay, so so this this is where I think we may be on some dangerous ground because, you know, let let, let me, let's go back to the nineteen seventies, okay, where you had films in America like Dirty Harry or. Um, or the other one be Death Wish. I don't know if you've seen these films, but they're, they're essentially films about people taking justice into their own hands because the state has failed them. Uh, yeah. they, they are essentially right-wing films opposed to liberal criminalization policies that were brought in uh, because 
the, you know, the law now seems to be on the side of criminals. We have to take justice into our own hands. And then you get kind of like vigilante revenge killings. Um, and do, do you see how the logic of what you've just said is, is basically exactly the same of the log as the logic of, a, you know, a right wing vigilante? Like, how do you draw? Like, if, if you say it's OK to do that, then are you not also saying it's OK for people to take the law into their own hands in other in other areas? Well, uh, firstly, I don't. I, I'm interested in the application of justice rather than um, following laws. I think uh, governments, the idea that it, intrinsically only things allowed by the government are right is wrong-headed and potentially rather dangerous. Because, it, I mean, we were talking about fascists in in Nazi Germany, for instance. The Holocaust was legal, it wasn't right though, was it? So the idea that we should allow governmental institutions, whether they be of a right wing or left wing bent to decide to be the absolute arbiter of what is right and wrong is, is bullshit. And ultimately, if the law is um, immoral, I think it's your, it's not just your right, it's your fucking duty to oppose it. And if you're being wronged, if, if, if in you know, the, the way you worded it, if the law is on the side of the people, then it's your obligation as a, as a civilised individual in, the, in a, a society to oppose that. So, so you would actually like to see, I just want to get this right, you'd actually like to see more, I guess, like vigilantism of people no, no, kind of following no, I, their own moral codes as opposed to the law. No, no, I, I, I prefer that we lived in a society that didn't, um, didn't ostracise people in that way, didn't marginalise people and didn't have incredibly unfair, uh, unbalanced uh, economic and social standings then you wouldn't need to have vigilantism. My point is, if vigilantism is necessary, then yes, I support vigilantism. It's not that I want to see it. I'd love to see none of it because we lived in a great society. But unfortunately, we don't, and it is necessary at times. Okay. In, in, I, 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 guess, I guess what I'm trying to press, though, is that, you know, your, your truth and somebody else's truth may be at odds. And so if you say if it's okay for a left-wing group to do something... You, by the same token, you say it's okay for a right-wing group to do something, and I mean, it, it, it seems it seems to me that you don't really resolve the problem. You just make it more violent. I don't think it necessarily has to involve violence in the sen in the sort of harsher sense of literally physically attacking. It can be civil disobedience. Like, uh, I mean, I don't like the Bundy group, but I think that kind of thing. If you think you're being wronged by the government and you take up um, illegal residence, as it were, within a, a government institution in order to protest this wrong that you perceive, I think that's a perfectly justified thing to do. But you don't have to go around killing anyone or, you know, punching Richard Spencer or whatever necessarily to, to be doing um, vigilantism or whatever. OK. Uh, as much as I would like to carry on discussing things like affirmative action, I think I'll move on to ask my second question, which is, in your assessment, who is winning the culture war and why? Um, well, I, I, I ruminated upon this when you asked me, because for everyone listening, I, you gave me these questions um, a couple of weeks back, wasn't it, when we originally planned to do this? Um, and I thought about it for a long time, and I've, I've sort of come to the conclusion that I disagree even with the basic premise of the question, because I really don't think there is a culture war going on. And that's not to say that there isn't conflict... Uh, a constant running conflict between uh, different factions within society. but that's nothing new i think when you and people on your quote unquote side i know I, for, for ease of, of uh, language um people on your side uh, tend to refer to it as if this is a new thing as if this is there's some sort of newly set boundaries of this side versus this side in a new battlefield on a, of, of a culture war and i don't think that's true i think you've sort of invented that um in order to try and justify to yourselves why you feel as passionately about something that you don't need to justify, really. Like, if you feel passionately about this thing, you don't need to necessarily invent a war or a, a cultural battle for that. I just don't think it exists. What about if I said that I think the culture war has been raging since at least the 1950s, if not longer? Um, it just has different names at different times. Uh, I read this book called uh, The Vision of the Anointed by a chap called Thomas Sowell, where he basically goes through how the culture war has raged in America between, uh, I guess, what you'd call liberals and conservatives or Democrats and Republicans. And many of the same uh, basic disputes that you see on 
Twitter and YouTube every single day have been going on since you know time immemorial, and that it's a kind of I guess an ever it has been like a, a like a long term struggle, um, and that you know at, at different times in history, some one side has been in the ascendancy, and at other times another side has been in the ascendancy. So if you see the current moment as a continuation of that, who do you think is in the ascendancy now? Would be the question. Um. Again, I, I don't agree with with uh, Sewell on on many things. Uh, I think his his analysis seems rather um, simplistic at times. And I think the way you've described it, I haven't actually read the book in question, but the way you've described it, I think is again another example of that. I think it is overly simplistic. Although I agree with the basic premise of the you know th- this kind of battle, cultural battle, because that's essentially how that works. People have different opinions and they'll battle it out. Um, hopefully, and certainly in the recent past it's been largely peaceful but for the mass majority of history it's been incredibly violent um and so the but the idea is of, of there being liberal versus conservative or whatever is again over far 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 more uh, simplistic than i would be comfortable with with arguing really because i don't think it's as simple as that i think there are even battles within quote-unquote liberalism and quote-unquote conservatism which range from marxists through to nazis basically so the idea that there is either two sides or possibly slightly more, uh, but, you know, single figures in terms of numbers of sides is is nonsense, really. I, don't, I just, I don't see that that's a worthwhile discussion to have because it takes, it doesn't take into account the complexities of the situation. This is interesting. Um, so, so you're someone who's made, let's say, a lot of videos criticising uh, people like Sargon of Cad or various other, I mean, you're channel is basically devoted to critiquing and attacking um, various different people who largely describe as anti-SJWs. If you're not engaged in a form of culture war with them, what motivates those videos that you make? Well, I, I mean, I am engaged in a cultural battle, and I don't I don't make that distinction just to try and make like a, a semantic uh, difference. I think there is a, an important difference um, in the, like I say, ba- uh, there's been a sort of uh, since forever, since civilization has existed, you've had those kind of cultural battles where you have different views of, uh, of the world and different um, opinions and different ways you think that the world can be made better. And so that, yeah, in that sense, I am engaged in cultural battle. But I don't see it as a war necessarily. I don't see it as uh, some epoch-defining battle that we have to win it, otherwise this side will win or whatever. It's just not as simple as that. I mean, ultimately... For, especially on on the internet, I don't see it as that important anyway. Because even if I weren't doing what I'm doing, I don't think it would make much difference. A because I don't have a huge reach, but B it's the fucking internet. It's not the the larger society. It's not the larger culture. The idea that that these little silly spats on YouTube have any impact. No one outside of YouTube, no one's heard of Saga of a Cad or me, obviously, or fucking Thunderfall or the Amazing Atheist. These people are fucking irrelevant. Um, All right, well, how about I ask you this question then? Out there in the wider world beyond YouTube, do you think more people would agree with Sargon or would agree with the sorts of views that you put forward in your videos? I think most people probably don't agree with either of us, to be honest. Um, I think, certainly, uh, the example I'll give you is when you... When you describe the way, like for instance, with with Saga, his thing with uh, Jess Phillips about I wouldn't even rape you, I, it struck me a few weeks ago when I was uh, discussing this with a friend uh, at his uh, family barbecue thing, that when describing that to other people, they were genuinely appalled that, that someone would say that to someone else on the internet. And it struck me that Carl's reaction, I think, was genuine. He couldn't understand why people were upset by that. Because when you're on the internet, you get kind of insulated mm. from from a lot of um, normal society in a way. You kind of get sucked into a fake world. It kind of, it kind of is an echo chamber in a way. Um, and so the way in which Carl converses, even if his ideas are sometimes acceptable to a wider audience, I don't think the way they're expressed is okay. And I think that's the same with me, because, I mean, I'm not going to pretend for a second that what I do is family-friendly entertainment. Um, I don't... Yeah, my politics are probably far to the left of main or not necessarily mainstream but just where the majority of people are certainly in britain um for instance we ran the even an election that the tories are probably going to win um so clearly i'm to the left of of the bulk of the british populace 
So I don't think that really the the vast majority of people would agree with either of us, to be honest. All right, and I, I will ask you my final question then, which is, what's the single biggest thing that annoys you about arguing with people on the right and or anti-SJWs? Um, well, firstly, uh, misrepresentation, purposeful misrepresentation is annoying. Um, some people may have heard or heard the line said that I what's say I mucked Thunderfoot's dad when he was dying of cancer. It's not true. Uh, Thunderfoot edited my video to make me look like that's what I was saying. I wasn't saying that in the slightest. And that's not the only instance in which that sort of thing has happened. That is incredibly frustrating uh, because it means you then have to wade through a thicket of shite in order just to start a conversation. It's ridiculous. So, but apart apart from that, the one of the things that annoys me about arguing with specifically very pro-capitalist people is the incredibly disingenuous distinction they draw between free market capitalism and corporatism. They'll say, um, you know, uh, when when they want to say how great capitalism, look, capitalism has dragged a hundred squillion, billion, gazillion people out of poverty. And you say, well, yeah, but what about this thing, this terrible aspect of it? Well, that's not capitalism, that's corporatism. Capitalism is the free market. Well, so you either, either we have capitalism now when you take the good with the bad, or we've never had your ideal fucking rosy fucking ANCAP and bollocks version of capitalism, and therefore you can't claim the good bits. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess I'm, I guess I'm more towards being pro-capitalist than you are. Um, and what I would say is that I mean, knowing the libertarian arguments I do, the, the the claim would always be that corporatism comes about when you have crony capitalism and a collusion between political power and business interests. So you can't get corporatism without the government kind of intervening and being involved. So it's better for the government to keep their nose out of business because basically corporatism is the end result when they when you know, when you get government involving themselves. Yeah, but I, I, to be honest with you, I think there's, a, again, that's that seemed, and I, know, I don't know you're, you're necessarily making that argument or playing devil's advocate, but to address it nonetheless, um, the, the, there's a symbiotic relationship, it seems to me, between large-scale capitalism and uh, the nation-state, and indeed uh, supranational uh, uh, entities like the European Union or NAFTA or whatever. Um in that you have um, large um, organisations like healthcare companies that will invest huge sums of capital in individual uh, politicians in order to protect their wealth. Um, and so you have essentially a kind of feedback loop of uh, capitalists who, I mean, then they're clearly not massively in favour of a free market, are they? Because they're literally paying politicians to pass laws to protect their wealth. Well, well, this is and politicians rely on that financial wealth in order to get elected. This has always been the libertarian argument that that you have to kind of, like, when that happens, that is bad, okay? Nobody will deny that it's bad, which is why they are against things like high regulation. Um, the, the idea is, is that the more you introduce regulations and government uh, controls on business, the more you get these lobbying groups, the more you get this kind of... Uh, you know, under the t table handshakes. You know, I mean, if you look at uh, if if you look at the history of, of American business, for example, FDR basically created you know monopolies in the auto industry, like Ford and GM. You know, high regulation basically pushed all of the other car companies out, and they effectively had a monopoly. Uh, he created monopolies between all of the airlines. I think there were eight different airlines that were left. Who basically got to carve up the pie between themselves, and nobody else was there. Um, and and so this is what happens when you allow, I guess, government to creep into business, and it happens under the watch of, I hate to say it, leftist leftist governments a lot of the time. And then you get into a situation where you get like a George Bush who comes in, for example, who, <laughs> how can I put this? Even though he's on the right, he's still basically continuing that kind of collusion between government and business. So it, it, I don't know, once it gets started, it's very difficult to then stop unless you start to try to cut back the the, the state interference. 
I don't, I don't know well, what the answer to that would be. Well, I, well, I would, I would point out. I think the example of FDR um, and his uh, governmental meddling in the economy is a really poor example for libertarians to use because following those um, increased regulations and those creations of, of monopolies, as you call them. Um, followed the most prosperous era in the history of the world anywhere. The middle class boom in America in the 50s and 60s was enormous, and that can be put down in large part to the high tax, high regulation um, economy put in place by the FDR and his government. Whereas when you have uh, Reagan come along and neoliberalizes the fucking whole situation, and then Gen Y and millennials get totally fucked by ruthless red and tooth and claw capitalism <laughs> all right well in the interest of time uh i think i'm gonna wrap this up now although we could talk for hours i'm sure is there anything you'd like to add before we uh before we say goodbye uh, well thank you for being so pleasant i thought this was going to be much more confrontational but this was really nice <laughs> kevin logan thank you very much thank you <laughs>